Well, that was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, all, th uh, all three projects or um, five contributors, thank you very much. Uh, and I think it is a challenge for, for us to sit here and now talk about um, the, the subject of, uh, of this particular session. But um, I do have uh, actually a variety of questions. Um, some of them are addressed to all of you and some of them are very, very particular. Uh, now, what I really enjoy is your, um, and I say for, for, for you to your um, engagement and your direct work and collaboration with other disciplines. Um, when I talk about other disciplines, I actually do mean biologists and people who architects have never ever thought about working together with and um, a lot of architects scholars and students still think that interdisciplinarity means to start working with an engineer at the beginning of a project um, or an artist or a dancer. I think that's more 1956. So I'm very, very happy that, that you do this, that you show this, that you promote this. And um, as architects, obviously we are, we are asked to, well, we are kind of still asked to produce buildings and then we're coming to an issue of scale. So you're working in biology, growing mushrooms, growing material, which is probably sound, but then we are dealing with building envelopes. And so there's one question, how, or do we actually need to ask the question at this moment in time, how do we impl imp implement it? And a second question for uh, all of you who are teaching, um, how do we implement this sort of practice of architectural research, and I think it's starting to be a real research, into um, a curriculum which is very, very close to the curriculum of not just the last century, but more the one before. Maybe, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, just, it doesn't fall. There you go. All right. Uh, um, you can well, I think I think as Michael pointed out, the uh, you know this kind of emergence between architecture and other species has been around s for for hundreds of years. I mean, there's yeah, but it's not been implemented. Yeah, uh, well, it's you know at some point we, we there is the nuisance issue, which was something that was brought up, but the uh, the fantasy of a of a of a connected biological world, at least in drawing and and many forms of of models, Greg Lynn's embryological house, etc. Uh, Gaudi alluding to other kinds of things built into the stone. Uh, I, I mean, it, it's the the direction as a kind of a spearhead or, or traje trajectory of, of thinking in architecture. Uh, I, I, I at least for me has been uh, has, has has just been around since since almost the dawn of, of architecture. Not that uh, you know we can always solve it by immediately looking to the natural world and mimicking those things, sometimes it's very hard. There's this desire to look at spiders and how they produce webs and getting the same kind of uh, uh, strength that you would receive at room temperature from a little biological organism with basically water and eating some bugs and creating this uh, uh, incredible uh, web-like material, uh, this, the spider silk. And there's laboratories that are out there working to do something like that. And I believe someone had a breakthrough. But, th but it's been a, a constant inspiration. Uh, it, it, but it didn't. Some of that work didn't come from architecture. It's, it's, it's. I guess it just. It's. I mean, I. You know, it's not like I have the answer. I, j I just know that. Uh, you know, we're in it, and we and working through it is 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 vital. Yeah, I do agree with that. Um, I'm just. I'm just saying that to be an inspiration is not enough, and maybe to extend my my question or comment to um, to Jeffrey. Uh, you showed a project um, which dealt with the blurring of the figure ground. Why the heck do you want to blur a figure ground? Just for the sake of blurring? No, the question is what kind of parameters do you use? So are these connected also to, um, to, to nature, but not just as an inspiration, which then relates also to parametrics maybe? <coughs> so maybe I just open this conversation to yeah, I, th I think I think I know what you're kind of getting at there, but 
Um, yeah, I think that, that there is a kind of a kind of close relationship to, let's say, the parame parametric question that you're, you're trying to kind of pose there. Um, sorry, I always like these kind of little pauses right now. You've kind of kind of caught me on this one. Let me be more, yeah. more direct. What yeah. were the parameters for you to arrive at this particular geometry beyond the desire uh, to blur uh, the figure well ground? Well, I think the thing is like the figure ground and the kind of, the, the, the aim to kind of blur it is, is, is one thing uh, in order to kind of try and actually have a kind of more cohesive nature relationship between the kind of parameters of what is initially the going to ground, and then what is initially going to be the kind of uh, the figure itself within it. Within some of the kind of parameters within the kind of geom geometrical kind of relationships, those start to kind of take on board, let's say within the kind of master plan project that I was showing. Uh, they would take on board more environmental conditions. So it's less about the ground, but more about the kind of ecosystems that surround it that are kind of particular to that location, for instance. Like being, uh, uh, let's say, the, the master plan in Reykjavik, that one. Uh, you have a kind of condition where you're kind of dealing with hurricane force winds on a kind of regular basis as a kind of key parameter. So that actually starts to kind of generate or delineate where the kind of the kind of vertical kind of the height of those that, that overall kind of landscape it comes from. Uh, also the kind of limited kind of sunlight over the kind of the, the, the span of the year. And that also starts to give a kind of specific kind of angle of that starts to begin to articulate that in relationship to the kind of heights that are then, let's say, uh, about programmatic placement or kind of uh, type of building typology that are needed within that kind of field. Um, the, yeah, but the, the kind of figure ground the relationship, that is more on, a, on the kind of, dealt with more within the kind of, the other kind of systems, the other environmental systems or kind of ecological systems that were there or present on that kind of, in that project. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, and th that isn't just to say that it's only going to be about the kind of vegetation, but any other kind of uh, species that were there, including the human species as well, and their kind of uh, default mechanisms. I and mean, having the city grid within that project is more about breaking up the plot, making it manageable within this kind of be what we're being asked to produce, which is a master plan, but it also allows for kind of vehicular traffic to kind of like work. But the primary kind of relationship was to also look at a more uh, sustainable kind of opportunity to that doesn't work at 100% efficiency, but works at maybe a kind of 50 or 60% efficiency to kind of maybe re readdress how the city should work for a kind of population which isn't so large, bringing in kind of cycling way and some paths and such. You know, I just wondered, would you mind extending that subject, like a very similar subject to um, the discussion which we always have in architecture, um, somewhere located between the function of delight and the function of figures and politics and optimization, because I think your project is is probably the most sensual and um, aesthetically delightful from what we've seen today. The, qu the question of optimism is optimization. Really I'm sorry. Optimize. Opt <laughs> well, and, I, and, and, and I'll use the word optimism. <laughs> uh, I, I, allow me, please. Yes. Optimism. Sure. Okay. Um, that's such a poignant one, isn't it? You know. Yeah. I, I mean, we're sitting here today in these times uh, uh, to 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 use such a word, and 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 naturally, when one quest one questions whether that's Naive, irresponsible, blind, or whether whether such such a word might be used really deliberately and effectively, and uh, I, I would it, it it seems to me that we've been through an absolutely horrible century. You know, um, sure we needed to have the re the revolution in the in the teens of the tw of the twentieth century. Sure, sure, there there the, 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 those revolutions. So very full of hope in in their time, the revolution in 1917. Let let let's say the political one, um, happened for a reason. Hap happened be because of a hi a hidebound world that was impacted and stuck mm. before it, a kind of solid 
elite of aristocracy and, and, cap, and capital that, that, that create, created such a sort of solid mass that could be s that, that needed somehow to be to be open, and yet a kind of truly tra traumatic kind of polarization of the of, of this past century of, of of moving back and forth between left and and right uh, of of, of uh, be between ter one territory or another the, the the kind of requirement to choose um, has produced such a viscerally kind of tra traumatic. Series of generations that that have been that that, that our parents have, have experienced, that it really does become a, a poignant question, uh, the the sense of motivation of purpose, and I it seems to me that the craft of optimism is is a re really an intriguing one to to foster this the, the sense of, of fertility, and of, of fostering p p possibility, and I I would I wonder whether I'm. If you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll translate that into, into the earlier question of, of, about education and, and about pa paradigms, because it se seems like it, it's almost an, a natural thing, uh, perhaps like the visionary picture on, on the front of the magazine that that, uh, that happened according to your work. This this sense of the new, of the new tomorrow, of, of a new century, of, of a design education for architecture. Perhaps it's an absolutely natural thing to do, to do when we're still at the advent of of, of, of the new century. Um, so what about Speaking of life, you know, or ecology, and and speaking of those terms as being a design space, I love I love the definition of, of ecology. Oikos meaning home, you know. I mean, in other words, an an involved system, systems that we are a part of, that that we that we live with. Uh, Rather different in tone, let's say, than than a system of 50 years ago, where we might be very intrigued with how dynamics put together and, and how we can find software processes and and and, and cybernetics and C, C machines start to work, but the the kind of felt impacts um, of, of 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 a system understood as ecology or as a near living system seems to be a a real a, a, a potent kind of mode for for a new architecture and that in turn then fosters the need for some new languages certainly mm. moving moving uh, building perhaps on finite element analysis and and and, and flu fluid realms and inter interconnectedness um, but move it moving rather beyond simple models of metabolism for for architecture I mean uh, you know if I think okay you know it was a miracle to have a one-stroke engine the, 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 the locomotive where just the momentum of the of the mass after the locomotive lurches in, in into motion and un, un, under the steam revolution a couple hundred years ago generates this incredible sense of, of mechanism where the two-stroke engine or the four-stroke engine kind of like like si ma massing together homogeneous things that that will be effective what what about finding the combinations of things that start to fuel each other so that we could really understand the kind of m multiplicity of disciplines that have, that, have, that have just been spoken of, or perhaps in in models or, or or in practice, and get a sense of their economy, get it, get a sense of the language of resilience that can come from mul multiple elements feeding each other and buffering each other, the kind of the, the kind of language that comes from an an economy of complementary systems feeding each other, so that we might start to understand simple things like fires as being sources of life, not just mm -hmm. consumption. So we might be able to, able to see whole, whole systems running. And it just seem, it seems to me that, that that fosters a kind of language that can give people traction. And then designers can start to see impacts in really quite resilient ways, not simply in terms of the sober expense of achieving something grand, but at what cost but rather also in terms of creating fertility. And that in turn then raises the, you know, to my mind, the, 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 the rather, the, the, like, well, the very poignant question uh, that, you know, that, that my colleague Ke Kev Kevin raised this morning about mm -hmm. a kind of a Cabrian explosion of fertility being invited, but at the same time with a mortality function so that there can be selection and, and, and cycling through it. So that a, so that clearing out can happen, and that's a, that's a tremendously difficult question. The kind of incredible encouragement that would allow such a garden to happen, but without visiting a kind of eugenics or or you know horrific kind of cancer function that would be needed in order to keep keep such a thing moving, um, but rather the the kind of 
many small actions of, of contraction and, and selection and staged mortality mm -hmm. and cost and measurement that might engender a kind of fertility. So now, now I'm trying to talk about not just an expansion, but also a critical kind of culture working directly in parallel with the kind of productive and in, in engineering and in, in industri industrial engin in engineering cul culture of generation. And that, to my mind, seems like a, a brilliant model for a school. So what I'm trying to talk about then is the craft of putting fact and fiction very deliberately together in a productive loop that, that might make for a, a, a very, very optimistic design curriculum. Thank you that, for that was a different scale than intimacy, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I also think that very interesting what we what we experience here because we see drawings from, um, from, from you guys and uh, also the drawings from um, from Philip that remind me very much at, you know, the, the drawings that you saw at, at the Bartlett or, or uh, BIA in, in the 90s and also in the 2000s and still in, in, in Columbia and all these schools and um, still those drawings haven't really been accepted by the AIA or the RABA so I'm a little bit concerned of, of that but um, that might be a slightly different subject. Uh, interstitial spaces, um, like before I throw this to, to the audience, um, I would like to address um, to Michael because uh, you guys showed um, the project uh, by Chumi where it sort of hangs over the existing structure. Um, this is an accident that happened that you had there like interstitial spaces, spaces that can be used by multiple um, cultures or ecologies. I mean, it's not been designed like this. And the other thing is if you provide interstitial spaces or niches for, uh, let's say, um, birds and bats and so on, is that really beneficial for the human being that lives in there? Or the building structure? Or do we need to find out how we design for pigeons as you mentioned at one stage. I think there are several s things that perhaps need to be addressed initially separately. And I think uh, the question of the envelope of Le Frenoir or the question of uh, figure ground is one of uh, exhausted dualisms. In a way, if you look at the history of architecture, I don't think that figure ground is inescapable. In fact, from the very early settlements like Chattel Hüyük uh, in uh, Turkey, you see that buildings are clustered up into a continuous fabric and that the roof surfaces begin to establish a new datum. And this is done for several purposes, uh, among others, defense so that you have a perimeter around the aggregation of architecture, but that you have a new plane that can be continuously inhabited, and you enter the buildings from the top, likewise the courtyards, mm -hmm. and the courtyards are actually partly made to house uh, goats and uh, sheep and so on, particularly when there is an attack. So this question of continuous planes, the question of the kind of artificial dualism between figure and ground or inside and outside is an interesting one to challenge. And Chumi's project is interesting because what is uh, uh, done there, I would uh, elaborate around the notion of an auxiliary architecture. There's an existing building, but there is a need that exceeds somehow the capacity of this building and the new an open envelope is laid around that. And we will find that this will become more and more a necessary thing to do in architecture today as we need to re-equip buildings that cannot be taken down at the rate that we may wish and replaced at the rate that we may wish. Take for instance all the uh, dismal housing projects across Europe from a particular kind of era mm -hmm. that still need to be there because people need to be housed but they need to be equipped with perhaps an additional other envelope that improves on the climate performance of the building or that provides much needed extra social space, but in contact and in exchange with the exterior environment in order to increase the range of use of these kinds of spaces, i.e. a 
space where somebody can go and smoke because it's not allowed mm -hmm. there or where you prepare your skis because it's nasty to have the uh, um, resin or whatever the wax inside. So the point what I'm trying to get at is that trying to challenge some of these inherited artificial dualisms and looking back at art architectural history but also looking forward to the kind of future that we wish to project uh, uh, gives the possibility to then say if we have particular desires in the design or design problems that we want to tackle, i.e. the integration of different species, is there a new space uh, that is that is emerging when we begin to think of the ground as probably as a duplicated or deep condition and when we think about the envelope as a duplicated deep interstitial residual or whatever uh, terminology one might want to use and bring with it also a certain kind of connotation in relation to other kinds of works. But uh, for Chumi, I think the notion of event could be nicely extended from the human to a multi-species event space. And so gaining consciousness of these kinds of possibilities, yes, then you would actually make an extra provision for bats or an extra provision for <laughs> pigeons or an extra provision for the kind of species that you really would like to see because you have realized that the opportunity is there and that these structures are unless you do something really severe, these structures are being populated and inhabited by other species. Okay. Uh, questions from the audience? The young gentleman in red. Uh, this question is, I think, one all of you can address, but um, I think it's particularly applicable to some of Philip's installations. Um, and the question is, in the process of forming the kind of cyclical and symbiotic ecologies that you design, how do you approach the necessary element of natural selection in evolving that final product? And uh, what would you suggest to a student as we approach this uh, issue in our design process? Well, the, co the, the concept of natural selection is such a poignant one, isn't it? I mean, in, in, in the sense of, of uh, perhaps having a, having a picture of fit things winning and other things losing and needing to get to the very best possible result because there's a sense of a caustic or acidic surround that you need to be able to stand up to and, and, and your, your progeny needs to be able to survive. I mean, if there's that kind of, of projection of, of, of a milieu that, that your work as a kind of a steward is, is being projected into. On the other hand, if it's possible somehow to foster a cycle um, so, that, so that one, one isn't caught in, in, the, in the absolute artificial stance the imposed stance of, of having to take a, a single stand, but rather if one's able to see something cycling through in, in many, many iterations so, so that one can, ha can have a kind of confidence of, of involvement and, and experience um, rather than the, di the disability of some, something being only a simulation and being, being anxious about whether it's going to perform, or on the other hand, on, on only being a, a builder and not not having the computational ability of, of great simulation that might make it more powerful. I mean, any point along that cycle in itself speaks of disability, but when if, if one goes through cycles of, of, of development, then, th then those kind of individual stances become quite artificial and unnecessary insecurities. And so prac practical working methods su such as the practice of thinking of things and then simulating and then projecting and then detailing and then prototyping and going through proof of concept and then beating it up and deliberately breaking it and cycling that through in, in, in order to have the, the kind of resilience of experience of, m of multiple cycles is a tremendously enabling kind of, kind of craft. And if one does that enough, then perhaps we can, with quite a lot of conviction, speak about fostering our own kind of natural selection 
that 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 is of, of, of fitness testing through through po through possibility searching, and and subjecting to involvement. I'd like to think so. You know, I I I, th I think that there can be design practices that are tremendously involved and and generative th through through those kind of of examples. And you know, M M Mitch's invocation of 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 the of the cheap fabrics is is one example of that. The kind of uh, the kind of ki kitchen sink approach. One doesn't have to be uh, too ambivalent about that either in the sense of that fostering a disability because one can access military economies as well. One simply doesn't have to choose. We don't have to worry so much about loyalties where we choose one thing or another. Instead, I'd rather kind of hold a model as being something like at least a T, you know, if not a T with multiple descenders. That is to really celebrate the craft of being a dilettante and being a generalist kind of lat lateral move, along with some, some silos, however many there are. And, and, and to think of, of, of that kind of s stuttering kind of model of involvement as being tremendously enabling and, and complementary. More questions? Your last chance for today with this crowd. There's one over there. personally have uh, great expectations uh, because um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, I think uh, uh, there are two or three uh, lessons to be learned from architects that are absolutely significant in the pursuit of some of the things that we're discussing here. Some uh, is to do with the inhabitation of one or several continuous planes, cohabitation, and the other one uh, is uh, also, I think, one of the uh, critical points put forward by my guys last night. And uh, that is somehow the seasonal changes and the changes in appearance, uh, maybe the changes in productivity, maybe the changes in interaction that need to be taken in con into consideration that today rests outside of what architects think about because the moment the climate envelope is established, we are more concerned with how we organize some sort of interior environment. And the, the question of the expanded threshold is where landscape architecture and architecture sort of meet. Um, so yeah, from my point of view, at least the expectations are great. I hope to learn a lot from you guys. Uh, I think it's a, I mean, it's a super exciting time to be doing landscape architecture. Uh, I'm I, I actually really jealous of the field. Uh, in fact, to the point, if I had more time in my life, I would have spent another two years and get that degree as well. Uh, but I, I don't see a kind of um, a purpose anymore to creating discipline boundaries. Mm -hmm. Even though landscape architecture is an autonomous field and there's a good century of, of folks that have defined it more or less, uh, I think landscape architects should, should certainly feel comfortable designing an automobile. I think that automobile designers should maybe try out their hand on maybe looking at cities or maybe designing an ecology. Uh, you know, architects could probably think about doing the landscape. I think the more shared you are in, in your field, or the more sharing you are in your field, the, the kind of more creativity and the more innovation is going to be kind of the end product or the resultant of such things. Uh, you know, there's clearly a merger, at least in Harvard, with when you think about landscape, urbanism, Charles Waldheim, et cetera, where the urban design slash planning degrees are, 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 are kind of embedded in, in landscape and ecology. And even though they are different subsets, and you can make all kinds of arguments about how they, they can be broken down into cellular conditions, uh, it is just a, it, it's really hard to say this is a boundary for the architect, this is a boundary for the landscape architect. I've seen both uh, 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 folks in different directions take on or tackle those objectives and, and do it just as good as someone else from, from the opposing field. So actually some of our best architectural designs and landscape designs came from a biologist and a chef in our group, people that technically know nothing about either field. And you, you never think that would happen, but they kind of stun us with their th these kind of physical models that they produce. And somehow we were, you know, through all our training and, and understanding of the kind of historical background for some of these projects, never made those moves, and or, or we would think they were ugly, 
or kind of a, a, a fail of production or naive, but yet we're, we're groundbreaking. And, and, and I think that there, you know, it's just, just a, to, to hammer home the point, the limitation that we have um, these disciplines is, is very difficult, especially in this day and age. I, I just think that there's, there's, there certainly should be a lot more bleeding between the two, and there, there, there has been. Maybe I can I can just pick up on on your comments as as well, and um, I, I want to speak about landscape architecture, and then use that to to loop back in into your your first question uh, or a question question I heard about pleasure. Um, uh, we've heard comments about figure and ground relations today, and if a cl if there is a question of how to gain traction in connectedness into interconnected systems, then it's, it seems to me that as architects, the parallel discipline of landscape architecture could not be more important and significant and available to us as, as the primary kind of discipline, the natural one, in which to discover the anatomy of the ground if architects are, are designers of figures in, in history. So, I mean, when, when, when we think of, of kind of natural languages, natural enabling design languages of, of landscape architecture as, as, as design of space, then of course we can start with the population of fluid and apparently homogenous spaces with, with, with species, with the orchestration of, of, o of overlapping increments of, of space as being natural languages. We can also think of the temporal dimensions, I mean, of working with time, of, wor of, wor wor of working with multiple stages of that space. And we can think of constituent parts and, me and metabolisms and equations, stoichiometry, that, I that is the, the, the counting of chemical pieces, of chemical effluents, of chemi chemical reactions, so that we can see how those, those spaces be behave and, per and perform and exchange and impact others. So it just it seems to me that, that the natural design languages that are already practiced in landscape architecture are, have a huge significance, a potential significance in, an, in enabling the expanded practice of architecture itself. Now when I think about that applied to the models, the wonderful models that, m that my colleagues here, here have, have just offered, I mean, the, 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 like the, the revolutionary, I mean, well, revolution, I mean, just the, the kind of radical porosity that's envisioned at the Brooklyn Na Na Navy Yard in, in, that in that kind of vision of, 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 a, of an integrated city. Or the language of transitional spaces that, that, that you both just offered us. I mean, an, incre an incredibly enabling kind of a assembly of ways that architecture can behave additively in, in an expanded field rather than working just with the polarization of nature versus city or building versus site then it seems to me that, that we could take that the thought about, about, la about landscape craft and move into a language of transitional spaces wholeheartedly. And that loops me back to, to your question about pleasure because in contrast to Freud's kind of discussion of the pleasure principle as being something infantile and you know only a baby would be obsessed with, you know? And then when we grow up, we can be clear of such emotion bound, such such kind of feeding kind of bo 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 bodily based based realms, and move into our head into into safe dry territory instead, then I wonder whether we might reclaim the term infantile, and see it as an enormously empowering, positive, beautiful state of of a path into our limbic centers, of a path into the formative elements that make up living systems, and through being acutely sensitive by inhabiting our infantile states, then perhaps that might engender a scale of values that would produce a near living architecture. And accompanying then the reclaiming of the word infantile perhaps might be a reclaiming of the word ambivalent. Because I've been taught that to be ambivalent is terribly weak. I have to decide, don't I? You know, perhaps the word ambivalent could be a sign, could be perhaps the, the kind of the, the queasy, uncanny sensation of experience ambivalence might be a sign that we are acquiring a sense of the multiple perspectives of the situation, that we are embodying the kind of turbulence of different impacts in, in understanding things. Perhaps it might be a kind of a body map response, an infantile body map response, to say that we are starting to grasp the subtlety of things in order to be able to become responsible and to engender 
spread f- f- further dimensions to them. So anyway, may- may- maybe those terms could be, re- could be reclaimed to- towards this kind of transitional state. Can I just pick up on something uh, at the expense of uh, coming across as conservative? Uh, I would like to just say something about the relation of, or the, the value of disciplinary specificity in a context where we, at least from an institutional point of view, seem to embrace interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity and so on. And uh, I admire the efforts that are going on in New York to place certain lines of inquiry outside uh, of constraining environments in order to go forward. However, I do believe when a chef makes a car, it is still useful for a car maker and the sensibility and critical ability of that person to moderate the output given that this person is not constrained by um, inherited uh, forms of knowledge that prevent innovation, Mm i.e. bigger ground what we tend to inherit and so on. So so I think we have to be careful that we don't swing to the uh, other extreme uh, of discarding the need for kind of moderation uh, of a kind of critical ability that uh, makes the fresh eye and the fresh view actually able to proceed in a kind of economic uh, way, I would say, uh, and in a way that is related to the possibility of turning things around within a kind of given time frame. I just uh, wanted to offer one quick thought that, that I um, was uh, last fall I was invited to speak to the incoming freshman uh, uh, class at Columbia University and what resonated uh, very much with this uh, young generation just starting college now I said to them s- when you enter college today don't you don't worry so much about what you're going to uh, uh, be your uh, major because none of you have one single career in your life you probably have five or ten and so pile as much knowledge as you, ca- as you can, and then you will choose. And then that's uh, true for a lot of us here in this room. So, you know, that uh, I- we can try different disciplines. Nobody s- uh, will stay really one. It's very hard to stay because it, you need to have a lot of versatile skills and knowledge to operate within cities. So I'm not that concerned about one single discipline. Thank you very much, everybody. We've taken much longer than we should have, but I think it was quite interesting.